Everybody, welcome back to Ghostwood, the Twin Peaks podcast. I'm Charles Skaggs, your recording challenged ho- co-host of the podcast, and with me is Zan Sprouse, who's getting hot in here. A bit. I only took off. I only took off some of my clothes. Some of your clothes, yes. Yeah. And uh, just get your minds out of the gutter, everybody. That's not. I love. I love how this is an audio podcast, yes. and now everybody knows what it will look like. And no one would have had to have known that you had recording problems. You just told all of our secrets. We're no longer filled with secrets, Charles. No, we have plenty of secrets. We're filled with secrets. We're filled with secrets. Yes, yep. filled with secrets. Yep. Yep. So, uh, welcome back, everybody. So, this is episode forty-five for the. Fourth episode of the second season, Laura's Secret Diary, we're going to talk about today. And this is, this originally aired on October 20th, 1990, written by, hold on, this is, this is a bit of a scorecard here, Jerry Stahl, Mark Frost, Harley Payton, and Robert Engels. Wow, that's a lot of good writers. Yes. So four people had their hands in this. And this was directed by Todd Holland. Okay. So this is I'm guessing this is a bit of a writer's room on this one. Well, as we said last week, a lot of things are going on. So yes. we're we've opened some cans of worms and a lot of stuff is going on here. Lots of weird wild stuff. Weird wild stuff, yes. Yes. And we get the return of Joan Chen at long last as Josie Packard. Yeah, she's been gone for a few episodes shopping, as it turns out, or among yes. other things. She's been shopping in Seattle, according to what she said to Pete. Yeah, so. that's, that's at least the story. Right. And we, we will find out what's going on with Josie a little later. Uh, not It's not good. None of it's good. None of it's good? Nope. <laughs> None of it's good. She does not bring Pete back anything from, you know, men's haberdashery or anything like no, that. No, no, no. There's no gifts for Pete, as far as we know, unless she's no. the one that bought him that mongoose, that stuffed mongoose, in this episode. That would be... That'd be pretty hilarious if that, that was the that case. Like, hey, I've got, I, I was thinking, since you like dead animals, here's a stuffed mongoose. Yeah. Here you go. I saw this at the store and thought of you. Exactly. And we get the introduction of the notorious Fumio Yamaguchi. Oh, not good. Not good. Nope. None of this is good, people. Nope. As the enigmatic Mr. Tojimura. Mm-hmm. And uh, we also get Royal Dano. Or Dano as Judge Clinton Sternwood, a character, a... a character I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of on this show. I yeah, thought, and the... I thought he had potential, and he's only in like a couple episodes. Mm-hmm. And we get the uh, death of a character who obviously had it coming big time. Well, yeah, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about that too. But uh, everybody can cheer as that happens. Oh yes. And, then, and, and, we will. and you can cheer as another character deserves deservedly gets the crap kicked out of him at the end of the always episode, good. which is always, always nice. Good. So see the, yes. plenty of things to look forward to this time. Yeah. Twin Peaks is it's got it last last episode. Some momentum started. Yeah. Cause so it's it, starting cause to get good because we're building to um, the big reveal. And uh, also the big climax of the who killed Laura Palmer saga. We're going to find that out pretty soon. So, but things are, things are in motion and, uh, it's getting, it, it only gets good from here. As far as I see concerned. plans within plans. It's worlds within worlds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I um, see you behind them. Me behind them? Well, I'm just, you know. Yeah. The, the, just, yeah, I got it. Okay. I'm just quoting Dune. I don't, you know, <laughs> I, I, there's nowhere else to, for me to go, but there. That's all right. Yeah. I got you. Yep. <laughs> That's how I roll. That's how you roll. On, how I roll. On Arrakis. Dune. Desert. Never, never one drop of rain. <laughs> <laughs> Father, the sleeper has awakened. Has awakened. Yeah. Hmm. So good. Yeah. I could, that's, that's another movie. We were talking about Superman, watching Superman earlier. 
and how I could just watch that movie over and over again. Well, Dune is another movie I can watch over and over again for for different <laughs> reasons. Dune is weird for me because I love it, but it puts me to sleep because it, if you put on the Alan Smithy version, yeah, well, it I don't, takes so long. See, I don't watch the Alan Smithy version. I, yeah, watch, I watch the Lynch version and the theatrical version. And yeah. It's very relaxing. The Alan Smithy yeah. version is very relaxing. I actually prefer because... the theatrical version because I like the um, Princess Irulan introduction to this the movie. I think it works much better. Well, I don't. I don't want to see a still cartoon version of half of the stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like the artwork is nice, but right. but it it's not exactly grabbing me as a as a um, no as a movie. So it's not nearly as cinematic as everybody would like to think. Well, I read a review that conceptual of, artwork is, but right. I read a review of Dune, mm-hmm. and a long time ago, and. Dune, of course, does not get good reviews. Right. Um, it's well loved, but it's not well regarded. And somebody said that the best thing about it is that it makes you want to read or reread the book. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing; it makes you want to read the book. So don't tell me the whole book in courtroom fashion drawing form. Yeah, yeah. very dry and formalized. Yeah. yeah, and it's great that it's Frank Herbert doing that narration, doing doing the voiceover. But yeah. still, I don't I don't want five minutes of it. Yeah. It so. doesn't it's not like he's a, a known actor, so it doesn't quite like if maybe if they had gotten Patrick Stewart to do it. <laughs> that would have been interesting. With yeah. with his voice. But, right. Or even if they had still gotten um or Kyle uh, Virginia Madsen. Or Vin, Any, yeah. you know. Yeah, anybody. Just, right. Somebody who can who can it, who it he sounded like a book on tape. Yes. Which is great, yeah, but it's, it's not it, a theatrical grab. That, that is great. It does, I totally agree with you. It sounds like an audio book. Yeah, and I would listen to the audio book read by Frank Herbert any day of the week. I just don't want that in the movie. Exactly. Um, exactly. All right. So uh, shall we start diving in? Let's do this. All right. So for everybody playing at home, we are at the 1 minute 31 second mark again. Just when it fades to black, or as is black, excuse me. Right after created by Mark Frost and David Lynch. So All right. let me get my headphones in. Is everybody in? I have two pairs of headphones, which is something I'm hoping to do something about here around Christmas time. Because I found out I'm getting a certain Christmas gift already. Oh, yes. Electronic electronic shopping lists are exactly. thwarting surprises all so, over the country right about yeah, now. Yeah, Best Buy, Best Buy just spoiled a Christmas gift for me because my email was linked to it. So, Aww. way to go, Best Buy. Spoilers. Try to act surprised. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <gasps> what in the world can that be? Yeah, yeah. alright. <laughs> <laughs> so, if everybody's ready, got their uh, movies queued up, We'll push play right here in three, two, one, doink. All right. And this, I think, is the eardrum of a tree. Yeah. First time I saw this, I had no idea what this was. I thought, the first time I saw this, I thought we were out in the woods somewhere. Because seriously, this is what I think the eardrum of a tree would look like. I thought this was like something like maybe there was an animal that had burrowed into something. And we do this slow route. Like zoom out, and it's very cleverly shot, mm-hmm. with a, a with a nice vertigo spin to it, which I I like. Right. And it pulls back, and there's holes, and then eventually we find out that it's the soundproofing in the uh, stair- sheriff station interrogation room. Right. And, and I think that's interesting because back in nineteen, this is nineteen ninety. 1990? Yes, nineteen ninety. Those little tiny cameras that get inside of something like that, expensive. Right. So. Well, I'm sure maybe Lynch or somebody with a production was like, we're going to use this again. Right. Right. We'll keep using, we'll keep using this tiny little camera, this super macro close-up camera. Maybe, maybe Lynch loaned his camera that he used for the ear in Blue Velvet. Ew. Maybe. Maybe. Quite possible. Yeah. So this is an interesting game here of Leland or Bob because yeah. part of me, the, the, the look on his face right now makes me wonder, is it 
isn't Bob because he's answering the questions in a very, I'm going to answer the question you asked me. I'm not going to be specific. It's very non-helpful. Just where did you go to Calhoun Memorial Hospital? I was going to look for someone. But at the same time, he has that that furrowed brow that Leland has. Yeah. And, 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 and I think and, and Leland, point, when, when with this, I'm sorry to interrupt that when he, we opened this episode, he's like checked out practically. He's yes. De- he's totally he's, checked out. He seems detached. Right. And I think at this point there's, there's a very good possibility that Leland is like, he gives zero F's right now. Right. He's pretty sure he knows some, one of the people that was involved in killing his daughter. So he's like, yeah, I killed him. He killed my Laura. I'm, you know, whatever. Come at me, bro. I think right. he's got that going on because, and then here we have him crying. Have you ever experienced absolute loss? And he says, no, it's more than grief. It's absolute loss. And Leland has been experiencing absolute loss right. since he was 14, since he was 14 and Bob came over him. And he has barely had control over his own body for the last 40, you know, 30, 40 years, something like that. So he's, well, 30 years, he was 14. So he's probably just like, whatever, I don't even care. Uh, You guys have no idea what I've been through. You have no idea how I just don't care what you do to me at this point. You know, my daughter's been taken away from me. My own freedom has been, even if you put me in prison, I'm still not, I'm, I'm going to have even less freedom than other prisoners have. So I think he is, I think it could go either way on this one. Yeah. And I think, again, shout out to Ray Wise for making oh, me was, not was, 100% sure who it is. That's just it what I was going to say. At any second. He, Ray Wise is phenomenal in that scene. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the um, just that, that, that that ambiguity between him, Leland and Bob and that, and I kind of wonder if maybe it's Leland, but Leland driven insane because of mm-hmm. Bob, right, right, and it's or you know like for, like he, like he's you know had has, has that that kind of um, detachment, like he, he's gone into a fugue state, mm-hmm. right. If you like, know what if you know what a fugue state is, right. Or like even in something like, you know, Samuel L. Jackson in A Time to Kill. I don't care. These guys raped my daughter. I'm going to kill them right here in the courthouse. I do not care what happens to me. Screw it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I think that, ew, gross, gross, gross. Yeah. um, Apparently Andy's looking for a retest. A retest of his semen count, of his sperm yeah, count. And I live, so, live Doc Hayward so clinical. He's just like, eh, put it in a brown bag and I'll wait in the car. He's like, so, I've got this. I've got this. This specimen bottle right here. Let's just hope it and, doesn't like Andy doesn't confuse that with someone's bagged lunch. Uh-oh. Oh, unless it's Chad's. Chad can use that as man as well. I hear. Yeah. Oh, look at all that coffee. All that coffee. Oh. Uh oh. And yeah, he was going to the bathroom with a copy of Flesh, Flesh World. World. So he specimen. So that awkward moment when the girl you like finds your porn stash. Flesh world bathrooms. You were going in there to be naughty. Ah, yeah. You take this and I'm sure it's shame. And I'm sure Andy's thinking to himself, well, you know, bumping into you with all the coffee right. is perfect. Fine. I, I'm good. Yeah. Um, I think uh, Andy's concerned because he was told he can't have children, but here's Lucy pregnant. Right. And I think he's hoping that it's his and not, uh, Dick Tremaine, as are we all. Right, because we don't want we don't want uh, Dick's DNA anywhere near anything uh, ever. No, <laughs> but but considering what you know, we know that it's Wally Brando. She's preggers with. I think it's safe to say it's Andy's. I think it's very safe to say it's Andy's. Yeah, that doesn't so seem to have a... any Dick Tremaine anywhere in Wally Brando. No, nope. I, I like Cooper here. He's got like rocking the old school Palm Pilot. He's got the PDA. From like a million years ago, where oh, the PD, yeah, yeah. So he's so he's all doot doot doot, and it's like, uh, like, man, if only like someone would invent a way to share contact information electronically. Yeah, it's it's essentially those old PDAs were essentially calculators. Yes, that could that could do um, letters, and they had a calendar on them. That was about it. There wasn't a lot you could do with it. And 
don't here's Andy like with his uh vial rolling under a chair. Yes, and Andy has new shoes. New shoes. New shoes. But again, and, I get ahead of myself. And skinny jeans or something there. He's all Oh, no, he's just got a he's just got a tight booty. <laughs> yeah. Andy got back. Bum, 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 bum. These are the same brand of boots we found at Leo Johnson's. So we now know that right. Leo Johnson bought his boots from Philip Gerard. Exactly. There's the connection. So we've got to find Philip Gerard because there's more to this than just cocaine being hidden with the shoes in the porch. We've got to find the one-armed man. Just like, you know, Richard, yeah. Kim, Dr. Ringer Kimball in The Fugitive. That's true. That's where that's uh, where Philip Gerard was named after. <laughs> Flip. Andy has, or Lucy is giving zero Fs right now. And she's she's so she's so you know upset and annoyed that even Cooper has no idea what her problem is right now. Right, exactly. <laughs> He's like, "What's up with Lucy?" And even he can't figure yep. it out. Hey, look, it's an actual different angle on the exterior of the Great Northern for once. Seriously. And uh, so we're in the we're in the Great Northern. Yep. And, and we find out that M. T. Wentz is coming to Twin Peaks. Right. I kept and, wondering if uh, that was like an anagram for something, but it doesn't work. No, I can't. Uh, I can't quite figure it out. But it basically stands for bitch. Yes. Yeah, pretty much. As we'll as we'll find out because total bitch. A major yeah. connection to Norma. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Which we don't, we, we find out later in the secret history, it's actually a stepmother, but in, yeah. in this, we were led to believe it's Norma's mother. Yeah. And here we have Belina Martin Logan as Louie Birdsong Budway. She's so excited. She's, yeah, she's cute. I, I'm, it's a shame that she wasn't in more episodes. I think she was a good hotel person to talk with. Yeah. Men. Well, MT Wentz is actually, isn't MT Wentz actually Annie's mother? She's Annie's biological mother. Is she? Oh yeah, yeah. I believe right. she is. Yes, yeah. yes. As we found yeah. out in the um, the uh, final dossier, I believe. So here we here we have Jean Renault talking to yeah. Benjamin Horn, basically saying, "Where the hell have you been? Come get your stupid daughter. Yeah, and feed her thousands of dollars I, of, of heroin." No, this, for no, this like he's he's gesturing to have him sit down. It's like, well, gee, thanks for letting me sit down in my own office. In my own office, but oh, here, look what we've got going on. Yeah, seen it. Yep. Got the remote. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Dinosaurs is on. <laughs> nice. Trying to, very nice. Trying to think of, very nice obscure reference. Well, I'm just trying to think of something that was on in 1990. Right. You know? Not the mom. Uh, it's like, the, I, I love that old, you know, VCP monitor, too, with all the... Right controls in it and it's gigantic and it probably weighs like 40 pounds right that's that's awesome oh uh, jean's making a move against blackie and emery that's the thing everybody's in bed with at least six people in this town when it comes to crime well. the only person who was working one angle was Catherine. right and look and maybe, how that and, turned out. And as I was saying, maybe that was her downfall is that she didn't have enough, yeah. um, you know, side projects. Right. Exactly. She needed to diversify her portfolio. Well, she just, well, her biggest problem was trusting Benjamin Horn. That's everybody's you know? problem. Trusting Benjamin Horn. I don't trust him any further than I could throw him. Nope. And I think with my person, back, I should I think throw anybody. I think the only person that, that Ben trusts is Jerry. That's about it. Yeah. yeah. That's he's, about loyal, it. he's loyal to his brother, and that's about as far as it goes. And even then, I think he takes Jerry with a little bit of a grain of salt because Jerry's a pain in the ass. He is. <laughs> Especially as he gets older and gets himself lost in the woods. Yeah. So Jean wants to kill Cooper. So Cooper has to be the one to deliver the ransom right. for Audrey. And uh, things are going to start getting getting interesting here with the FBI. Because we're going to have to bring in, we're going to need some more FBI guys. <laughs> Very nice Die Hard reference. Thank you. Well played. That's no. coming out in the movie theaters too. Yeah, for Christmas. For Christmas, yeah. I want to go it's see that too. 
totally oh. going to go see because that is my favorite Christmas movie. It's, it's okay. The chair had it coming. Yeah. It's just it's sitting there like it, like it owned the place. Yeah. Um, yeah and it, do we, ever, did we know where um, Jerry is? I mean, I, we know he, oh, where like, he goes. Should... Well, probably like to go um, with Norwegians or whatnot to, uh, or, Icelander, Iceland. Icelanders. Yeah. Maybe, maybe he's with gross, them. Gross, gross, gross. Don't tell high school girls how pretty they are. Oh, he is so, yes. He's just, you know, that's yeah. the thing. It's like, he gives me the, he gives me yeah. the willies. Like they're like, yeah. if he works at the double R diner, then they can't have teenagers within 500 feet of it. Yeah. Thanks for the compliment. Skeevy McSkeeverson. Seriously. Oh, MT Wentz. Oh, it's rabbi chili. What does yeah, that mean? No. <laughs> is it kosher? Ra- oh, it's, rabbit, it's chili. rabbit chili. Because right. rabbit chili is on special. So it probably tastes like chicken. But rabbi chili. <laughs> that's a that's a rather uh, disturbing bit of chili, I would think. It's kosher. Maybe, it comes, it, it it comes it, with matzah instead of saltine mm, crackers. Mm, rabbi, rabbis. <laughs> it's been it's been blessed by a rabbi, so it's kosher. Mazel tov. Mazel tov. Oh. Let's take some. Let's, let's take, take some petty cash and yep. go buy some tablecloths. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take a hundred. I'm gonna spend fifty bucks on tablecloths, and then I'm gonna go spend the other fifty on gambling, drugs, you name it. A new gun. Okay, here's my question: How does the Double R Diner have a hundred dollar bill? What, could, po- what did you possibly buy at a uh, diner? I'll tell you how. All Cooper, the pie. Cooper buying pie and coffee. Seriously. Cooper, Cooper like, he probably bought Norma, like, a wing on her house. Yeah. Oh, hey, the, reason to call Ed. Sure, I guess. Yep. I guess I'll do that. <laughs> you know, and this, this is the thing about him. He's such a psychopath that these are all really good ideas, and it yep. sounds like he's being really nice. Everybody stop. Hammer time. Aw. What should we drink to? Giving giving booze to a minor, maybe? Let's drink to Ben. Think? Yeah, drink to Ben. Oh. Yeah. Laura's very sweet, but you are giving booze to a minor. Or at least think, somebody who's... I'm are sure you that, considered a minor if you're between drinking age and legal age? Well, How does that work? I guess it all depends on what the legal age was back in 1990 in Washington State. I thought it was 21 federally in the 80s. I don't know. Well, according to Chris. Yes. Chris is up on went, this. Well, it went 21 in the, it went 21 federally in the 80s, like the year he was supposed to turn 18. Oh, that's how he knows. That's how he remembers. Because he was directly <laughs> affected by it. Okay. He was, he was about ready to drink in Virginia. And then they raised it. And then they raised it federally to 21 <sighs> all over the country. And he's like, what is this noise? Yeah. So yeah, I'm pretty sure it was. Um, yeah, because you yeah. were, you were 21 by this point, so it didn't matter to you. You wouldn't have right. known. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So let's see. Roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and my father killed me. Yeah, pretty much. Can we just maybe say that here? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, her. That's the thing about this this diary is it's not gonna. It's not going to make you feel any better about her. No. no with her. I, I love the fact it's like, well, hey, let me read you a passage. And he, it's talking about, like, Laura getting with these really big guys. Mm-hmm. It's like, and maybe, talking maybe, about- you should, maybe you should have proofread that before you, like, maybe marked a, a page that would have worked a little better. I think he might have seen the part where um, uh, she saw that... Um, where he saw that she was talking about how much she loved Donna and how worried she was that if Donna really knew her, she wouldn't like me. Right. So, you know, I think he was trying to um, give her that. But then when he realized what he was reading, it's like, oh, my God, this is a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, this and Harold is talking here about how people listen to him. And since he kind of is able to listen to things and take it he doesn't have the the noise of the outside world right. bothering him. So he um, is uh, having a, 
he has the ability to sort of take everybody's narratives and look at them in, a, in because he he can he can allow his mind to spiral outward. I think I think it kind of feeds his the his insecurities of his ego a little bit because he's lonely, but he feels kind of self-important that people tell him secrets. Right. And I think he likes that he has something that he can do for people because he can't leave the house. He can't. And he likes that people talk to him because he doesn't get to see the world. He gets to see the world through other people's eyes. Right. And sadly, through their problems. Yeah, and he tried to get, and, like we just saw, he tries, he's like, well, maybe you can tell me some stuff too. Right. And, you know, maybe he can process it in his observant herald kind of way. $120,000 cash, which, you know, Ben Horn is like Mr. Burns. He has that in his yeah. back pocket. Let's see. My, my daughter's been kidnapped. Let's light up a big old cigar. And... Well, he's not there for carrots yet. So, nope. nope. Oh, we're back huh? from shopping. Yep. Yep. Oh, here's my cover story. Here's what I think is funny. It's going to be one hell of a JC Penney's bill. She comes in with like five hat boxes. I've like never seen Josie wear a hat. Right. That's so funny. And, uh, oh, we're going to find out soon enough. Uh, well, yeah, here's Josie a, only heard half the story. Yeah. Uh, turns out, well, Catherine died in the fire. Yeah. Well, or so we think. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, try not to act too excited yeah. when you're with Pete. And and here's jo- here's Josie going, oh, that's terrible. I'm yeah. so upset that Catherine died. Well, here's the thing about Josie. She she genuinely feels bad for Pete, but she's going in her own mind like, oh, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have to deal with that bitch anymore. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. It's like even even yeah. the song of fire, you would have seen the body. Yeah, and she's trying so, to act all innocent, like, oh, this is the first time hearing of this. Yeah. Yep. You know, but she's... Meanwhile, you know, she's the Hall of Ghostwood. Yeah, seriously. Meanwhile, <laughs> in the Black Woods, in the, in the Black Lodge. Oh, Emery Battis. That's oh. okay. You won't have to put up with it much longer. Ah. Uh, like, doodly, 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 doodly. Just, just stop giving me heroin, please. Um, I think I'm high. Yes. Awesome. Like I'm getting seasick from this. Am I, are we on a boat? Yeah, seriously. This is. <laughs> mm. Yeah, and Jean is not pleased with this. I think it's just the excuse he wanted. To off Emery. Yeah, exactly. Um, He's trying to win her confidence because she's stoned out of her mind. Seriously. Poor little thing. Well, and I, yeah, it's, it, this is, he's definitely trying to, you know, right. Get his for this. He doesn't really care. What's going on with anybody else? God, this office is um, the worst. So god, <laughs> you really hate you really hate this decor. I really hate this decor, and oh, so oh. sad. Somebody get a vacuum and clean that. Thank up. Thank you. Yeah. So that's one down. Yeah. So yeah, somebody get the vacuum and clean that up. Fitting. Yeah. <laughs> Ironic. You ruined that. Po- Poor ugly carpet. You ruined that poor disgusting carpet. Maybe we could get somebody in there and get some better decor. He owed me money. <laughs> <laughs> if you drink the last cup of coffee, kindly make another pot. Right. I Which hope, looks like I, what Lucy's doing right here. I hope the station has like a recycling program for all those donut boxes. It's not a good idea to be talking to her right now with a knife. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> and Cooper's just the- like, okay, this is getting really old really fast. 
Yeah, he's like, seriously, you need to, you know, you got to deal with this because you're really annoying the living crap out of all of us. And you're turning Andy into a, a bigger bumbling idiot than Andy usually is. Right. So. You're not well, really good for office morale, Lucy. See, and this is, you know, Lucy, I don't know if you should be looking a gift horse in the mouth like this. You know, maybe he's not, he's not, he doesn't exercise. He's not very cultured. So well, we're going to go to Dick Tremaine. Yeah. Seriously? Yeah, I know. She's just like, well, he doesn't even own a sports coat. So, yeah. so yeah, like, yeah, he sounds like a real a-hole. I want to know what, to, oh, so she had a little bit of a, they were, so they were on a break is yes. what she's telling us right now. Right. Um, she wasn't exclusive. She was back on the market. Yeah. And so I wonder what she's, um, what TV show she watched that told her she needed me time. Was it like <laughs> Sally, Jesse, Raphael or something like that? Are you still seeing this dick? Right. <laughs> Donahue. It was Donahue. It was Donahue. Yeah. That is dick with a capital D or not. The sentence works either way. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Yeah, I think you should get back. I mean, if your choices are Dick Tremaine and Andy. I think it's kind of a going, pretty obvious. I'm going with Andy. I don't know why you even go for Dick Tremaine. But like I said before, right. a-hole guys for women are like the Matrix. You have to be shown. You cannot be told. Mm-hmm. Everybody has to experience that to learn what to stay the hell away from. And are those just old boxes just sitting there that somebody needs that's to break down and recycle? That's, that's what I'm that saying. Like, donuts that's what I'm that's saying. That's like like I, gonna go they really need a dip. recycling program for all those donut boxes. Yeah, I'm just wondering if that's like, if do we just pull out a donut box every hour? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's just Lucy's normal routine. It's like, oh, Cooper's in the building. Okay, here's a here's another couple donut boxes. Oh, Cooper. No. I'll be, I'll be, Diane, I'll be shooting up my insulin in five minutes. Five minutes, yes. This is a bookhouse boy plan. Yep. And it is going to... This is this spoiler alert. This is going to get Cooper suspended from the FBI for a little bit. Yep. You're not going to ask me out, are you? Well, I'd go out with him. This is where they get that the Cooper Truman shipping going. All the the slash fic. Yeah. (laughs) Which I'm sure is out there somewhere. Could I love him more? He's so dreamy. He's like, we're going to kill somebody, and it's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Andy. Andy gets Beware the moon, in. David. That's no moon. Now, see, I don't like a diner with, like, these tablecloths and flowers trying to be all fancy. Right. I don't know. What, but it, I, I get why they're trying to do it, because, hey, it's a critic, and it's a big deal if he recommends the place. Right, it is, but there's no... Um, but I think they're going about it completely the wrong way. Yeah, it's... Um, yeah, the flowers and the tablecloths. It's, just, it's, it's overkill. Right, and seating somebody. That's not a diner. A diner, you find a table that you need. Yeah. You get, you get a $1.95 BLT and a you know $1.25 slice of pie. And then you're on your merry way. Or you just hang out with your friends. It's not. This is not fancy dining. And I, for a reason. I grew up in a family restaurant. All they care about is, like, is the food good? And is the waitress nice? Yeah. <laughs> Poor Toad. He has to go eat like, messy I th- food. I think you're going to go, you need to go in the kitchen. Yeah. Well, it's also red herring. Yep. Hey, what's happening? Hi. <laughs> oh, we forgot about the bathroom. Oh my God. Get a hose. <laughs> Get a hose. Yeah. Just finished painting mm. it. Right. Yeah. Five years oh. ago. Toad is apparently eating out of, like, the soup pot that's that, just there for everybody. <laughs> that darn Toad. It's like, uh, what? You wanted me to go back in the kitchen, and now you don't want me in the kitchen? Make up your damn mind. And that's the thing, too. This is the... Um... Oh, and here's... <laughs> don't mind me just stealing a wallet. No big deal. Yeah, seriously. Oh, meanwhile, in a booth we've never seen before... Meanwhile, on the other side of the restaurant, the secret booth. Yeah, those, fl- those the flowers and those little candles. Right. It looks like a 1980s Chinese restaurant, frankly. 
it's like right out of a Christmas story. Yeah, I'm really, really mad at you for holding the hand of somebody who was crying. <laughs> yeah, who said we couldn't see other people? You did when you freaked out because I held James's hand. <laughs> oh, good job, Maddie, turning it back around on Donna. Are you seeing somebody else? Maddie, yeah, I need your help, yeah. even though I'm going to treat you like a total bitch and tell you I'm totally mad at you. These two are staring <laughs> daggers at each other. Just like, yeah. bitch, 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 bitch. Which is ridiculous because, yeah, seriously, she was consoling somebody who was crying. Right. And I don't think the problem with James going out right. with Maddie is the fact that he's stepping yeah. around, stepping out on Donna. The problem with James going out with Maddie is Maddie looks exactly like his dead ex-girlfriend. Exactly. And that's just weird, yo. Right. That is just creepy. So. so, like, maybe you would be more concerned about it. Maybe you should have been more <laughs> concerned about it, Donna, that... Hey, she took off her glasses and broke them, and now she looks even more like James's dead girlfriend. But it's still creepy that if he goes for her, that's still kind of creepy. That's like that's like your. Uh, and, I, uh, and I love Donna's. Like, even though I'm pissed at you, I need, I your, need help. your help. Yeah, yeah. help and me. I think you should put that wallet back there, Hank. It's ominous not ominous yeah. Hank is ominous. Ominous Hank is very ominous. Meanwhile, in a Hammer horror film. Oh, yes, exactly. Hey, Josie's back from shopping. Where the hell are you hey doing? Oh, let's not talk about that. I have a nightgown. So. Yeah, I think. <laughs> yeah. Josie's acting so like got her baby doll voice going. Yeah. And... She's trying to she's trying to make Harry forget that she up and left before the town Right. Came completely unglued. Let me show off my stems. Yep. Seriously, were you really in Seattle? Yeah. Did you see all my hat boxes? <laughs> that of hats, empty hat boxes that of hats that I don't wear. Yeah. Exactly. These are fancy things. Right. Yeah. I told you I had to get away. See, I'm a manipulative psychopath, so I'm going to make everything your fault. She's really working him hard here. She's she's good. Josie's good at what she does. She's survived this long. Mm-hmm. I still want to know how she got... Uh, so do you think she actually cared for Harry at all or didn't? Oh, she totally cared for Harry. You think? Yeah. I think. Oh, yeah. I think that's... Harry and Pete were making her sort of want to kind of turn around. That's why she... I think that's why she stayed in Twin Peaks. Okay. The try, after, to try to, like turn her life around, but then, like, because of Jonathan and all these others, she got pulled back in? I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, but, I think but, she's, but, but she shot Cooper. Spoilers. Because he came here. Right. Well, he was going to he was going to mess up her nice little her nice little Lumberton existence. Right. You know? He was going to screw that up, and that's why she did it. That's yeah. why she... She didn't want him to uncover which, his... And I love this. She's like, rip it. Rip it good. Yeah. When a problem comes along, you must rip it. You must rip it. Rip it good. Um, Josie is filled with secrets. And she knew that if Cooper came and started like doing background checks on people, yeah. she was, he was going to find out about all of her Hong Kong shenanigans. Right. Notice how I used the I word see what you, I see what you did I there. Used that, I did that well on purpose. Played. Yeah. What are shenanigans... So, <laughs> Mischief. Yeah. Yep. Twin Peaks, the trashy romance novel, coming soon. Yeah, seriously. You know what? At least untuck your shirt, Harry. Come on. Well, something tells me that shirt's going to be on much longer. I hope not. And meanwhile, in the window. Meanwhile. Meanwhile. Oh. Dun, 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 dun. Da, 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 Jonathan in the window. Ah. Somebody followed her home from Seattle. Like, and now he's just being pervy. Yeah, it's like That's the thing. That is so hot. Oh god, I want that Fire King mug so bad. <laughs> that is that is amazing. Yeah, Green Fire King. That is so pricey. Is that what that is? So cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I did not know. It looked kind of like Santa Claus to me. It was to the right of Santa Claus. Oh, I see. It was the green the green mug, not the uh Okay. Oh, here's the judge. Here's Judge Sternwood, everybody. Oh. 
What you got cooking? How's about cooking something up for me? No. Oh. Buddy Epson. Well, the Buddy Epson Society. Buddy Epson impersonator. Judge yeah. Sherwood. <laughs> <laughs> Buddy Epson, for those of you who don't remember, yeah, was, it's, it's uh, kind of an obscure reference. Yeah, Barney B. He Jones, was, uh, and he was a uh, one of the Clampets. Yes, he was. He was Jed Hillbillies. Clampett back in the day. Beverly Hillbillies, the original, the OG Jed Clampett. The OG. And did you know he was almost the Tin Man? Yes, I did know that. But, but apparently, he was, he was the- allergic to the makeup. He's allergic to the silver makeup. That's exactly so right. Lost the role. Which, you know, was probably made out of like silver nitrate and probably. Yeah. Um, <laughs> probably so, he's very fl- so he's probably very flammable. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Judge Sternward, we're about to go and do something illegal and I just had sex. So could yeah. you maybe <laughs> have a please? Exactly. Your Honor, Your Honor. The Winnebago. I love this guy. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> See, this guy was a spinoff series waiting to happen. Oh, yeah, he was fantastic. Judge Stewart in the Winnebago with Sid, and they fight crime. See that? That mug he's carrying, that's a fire king. Okay, I did not know that. Yeah. I did not know that. Yep. It's highly collectible because it, it's so cool. Judge it's- Stewart would redefining Cooper's idea of heaven. Yeah, pretty much. Heaven, oh, is God. A, heaven is a large and interesting place. Oh. Hey, Dick. Belinda Carlyle told me that heaven is a place on Earth. <laughs> I've been miserable because I found out that you're going to have a baby and it might be mine and that's going to ruin my horns. To... Are you wearing a flannel plaid shirt with an ascot? Are Again. you kidding me right now? Yep. Are you kidding me with that? That's what he was wearing when he was in. The, he took her to the Double R Diner for their big feast. Oh my gosh! Apparently, that, apparently, he's really into the idea of flannel shirts with ascots. Yeah, I have to. I must do the right thing. Yeah, that's romantic. That's what you want to hear. Yep. Oh, it gets even better. Uh huh. It's enough money for the clinic if you go before yeah. twelve weeks. Yeah. It's like that awkward moment when the guy that might have knocked you up uh, pays for your abortion. That you didn't even ask him for. (laughs) Yes. I mean, if you asked him, that's fine. And he, you know, but this, yeah. She didn't ask him. It's all like, hey, here's some abortion money. Go go have fun, yo. Because we're doing that, right? Right. The little Mm -hmm. problem. Yeah, the Cause problem. Because he, he's a, he, he's a, he can't even be man enough to like say the word abortion. Well, or, I think like, it's... Well, maybe it's standards and practices. Too. I was going to say, I think that's an ABC call. Probably. You know? Probably. And this is even before they got bought out by Disney. So Yes, it was. So I think that's probably what uh, yeah. why we're using the euphemisms here. Probably. And uh, <laughs> turn the key... Go home and Jade takes money and shove it up your ass. Yeah, credit to Lucy here for telling him to stick that where the sun doesn't shine. Yes, good for her, you know. And, you know, I think she realizes that he's going to fight her, you know, but she doesn't care. She gets all. You know. It's like, fine. Fine, have my baby. See if I care. (laughs) See if I care. I'm like, I'm going to give that kid a discount. Yes. On baby clothes. That kid's not going to get a 20% discount at Horn's department store. So not. Seriously. Aw, poor Me- Lucy. Meanwhile, Andy overhears. Lucy crying. Keeps, <laughs> keeps on walking. <laughs> well, he has to He has to take Leland into it, it was uh, probably It's was probably a good thing. She but that's the thing. She... Is he stops and he wants to go see Lucy, but he's got to do his job. Right. But she probably so. needed that alone time, I think. Well, that's what the TV show told her, <laughs> you know, and she's done nothing but act like she doesn't want to see Andy. Yeah. Now, don't you so, think that the Twin Peaks Sheriff's Department could afford a map of the city as opposed to just drawing it on a blackboard? <laughs> well, isn't that the same blackboard that they took out in the woods with them? Yeah, it is. Well, I don't th- they probably didn't want to take their map out. Their map is probably one of those roll down things, you know, like we had in school. Right. But I mean, couldn't they just like take it off and tape it up or something and 
I guess. But they also had to draw the mountains. <laughs> so little fluffy clouds. Yeah. There's no ac- there's pretty, no ac- there's there's no mistakes, there's just happy accidents. Pretty little trees. <laughs> Maybe he has a friend who lives right here. Um pretty little sycamore trees. And I'll see you and you'll see me. <laughs> Witness me. It's a, it's like a uh, it's a pretty brave guy to wear Nike shoelaces as a bolo tie. <laughs> Hey, he cut the aglets off. Give him, a, give him some, right. give him some credit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, where is Ludwig yeah. the prosecutor? Right. It's ten p.m. and we're drinking in the conference room at the, at the yeah. police station. Isn't that where everybody is on a Thursday? <laughs> yeah. yeah. This I think is Bob, because he's trying to hold his. Yes, he's got a little bit of a smile to his face. I, well, and he's I, trying to hold it together, and he's trying to be Mr. polite. Yeah, like and, give everybody what they think they want. Yeah, so I think this is, the, and I think for Leland's survival, I think yeah. he's probably shut down, and Bob, he's let Bob take over. So this is the Bob that kind of goes off, like says something, then goes off to a, a private corner and starts giggling to himself. Yes. Oh, I feel like everybody in the '90s had that jacket. And along came Sid. Here's Sid. When I first saw this, I thought there was going to be some sort of Sid Cooper thing. Yeah, there was. I mean, he's he does seem like hey, she's she's intriguing, but they went nowhere with that. Absolutely nowhere. Hook up the Winnie. Is that some sort of euphemism I'm unaware of? <laughs> That's what she said. That's what she said. Yep. Bye. Yeah, that's uh. That's it. They put the uh, put the kibosh on that possible love thing right there. Right. So. Oh, it's thunder and lightning. It's ominous for our right. trip across the border to get Audrey Horn back home. Lumber Queen semifinals. <laughs> the Tri County Lumber Queen semifinals. Who is this mysterious yeah. Japanese character? <gasps> Enter Mr. T- or what is his name? I forget his name now. It's like Takamura or something uh, like that. Tajimura, thank you. Tajimura. Yes. yes. Hello, Mr. Tajimura. You sound like you have a frog in your throat. And you have absolutely no burn marks on you. But credit to the makeup department because this is a great disguise. It is kind of a good disguise, yeah. But, you know. Slight, lightly racist, but a good disguise. Slightly racist, yeah. That's a little bit, uh, yeah. That's that's the one problem. Yeah. And uh, the the voice is terrible. So here's So here's a fun fact. Uh, apparently, David Lynch asked Fumio Yamaguchi's identity to be kept secret during the, from everybody in the cast. Really? Yes. And apparently, Peggy Lipton thought that um, Isabella Rossellini was the one under the makeup. Interesting. A little, were they tri- still... a little trivia there for everybody. Were they still together at this point? Yeah, I think they were. Because I, I, because this was, because remember this wasn't far after Blue Velvet. Mm-mm. So I think no, they that's were still, true. So I think they were still together at this point. Because I remember that they were, um, and she would be about the right height for Isabella yeah. Rossellini. I'm guessing. Yeah. Louis making the phone call. Yeah, but everybody thinks it's uh, M. T. Wentz. Yep. Oh, little little do they know. So. Oh yeah, this is. Yeah, let's uh, introduce Pete to Jonathan. With uh, here's the infamous uh, stuffed mongoose. The stuffed mongoose. With, with what looks like a feather duster on the end of it. I know it's adorable. <laughs> what in the crap are you doing here? <laughs> like here, hold this. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I think she. I think she. Uh, 
actually likes Pete. Pete. So I think she's having a hard time with this sale of the mill because that means she's got to like bamboozle Pete. I don't think she wants to do that. Eckhart. When is he going to show up? Our first reference of Thomas Eckhart. I need him to show up. I'm so excited. It's going to be good. David Warner. Oh, so good. Love me some David Warner. Who does? What about the sheriff? Oh, he means nothing to me. Yes. That's not what I asked you in the lady doctor. (laughs) It's like, leave me alone. I'm petting my mongoose. Cooper, are you playing Go with your peanuts? Now look at it. Cooper has like organized the nuts into like yeah, this weird like triangle playing, pattern pointed at himself. He's like trying to play go with his penis. This is like total Rain Man type stuff here. He's doing seriously. So Harry is the best man he can come up with to help Cooper. Oh, uh, his... you got me. Oh, uh, I see what you did there. And uh, in their illegal yep. snatching of Audrey across the border. Although go, she go is... team bookhouse. Yeah, go team bookhouse. Seriously. Oh, so here in the, let's, let's, in the kitchen. Let's enjoy this moment, shall we? Yeah. Hank answers the door. Oh, nobody's there at the door. Mm-hmm. In the double R. And Great. it's like he it's like he lives in the kitchen. Yeah. In his, uh, <laughs> he sleeps on the floor. In his pajamas. Yeah. Seriously. It's like that. Uh, bum 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 bum. Oh, lights go out. Jonathan, what are you doing here, all men in blacky? I'm doing my Blues Brothers impression. How are you doing, Hank? <laughs> Have you seen the light? Have you seen the light? <laughs> Guys, you know, do what you got to do, but keep the diner intact, please. Right. And if I mean, you guys. I, I love Hank thinking he can fight because he obviously can't. I'm going to be angry. So Hank tries to like, yeah, beat him with a with a with a flashlight, and then he tries to throw a punch, completely misses, and now he's going to go all kung fu and a really bad roundhouse kick. I love how he tries to do that, like yeah, that yeah. like kung fu karate move that seems yes. like we saw yeah. Yeah. in every single '80s detective show. Everybody yeah. had to punch people out. Yeah, to quote Chun from Remo Williams, "You move like a pregnant yak." <laughs> What are you doing? Blood Brothers. Charles, have you ever seen Fistful of Yen? No, from the I Kentucky, have, from I the have Kentucky Fried movie? I, if I did, I think it was a long time ago. Highly, highly, highly recommend it. So, so yeah. Jonathan smashes the flashlight in Cliffhanger. In Cliffhanger! Bum, 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 bum. Dun, dun. <laughs> Oh, yeah, and you notice that uh, there's nobody in the credits for... Uh, Laura Palmer's theme. Nobody's in the credits for Mr. Tajimura, and nope. there was nobody out of the ordinary in the opening credits either, so... Right. Who could it be now? Yeah, because now, yeah, Fumio, Fumio Yamaguchi's credited at the beginning of the episode, and just as Fumio Yamaguchi doesn't say you know, who that person is or what have you. So they, Mm -hmm. they, they went all out. They tried to keep this pretty, a good secret. And I think it worked. Yeah, they did. Probably would have been spoiled in today's era with the internet and all, but. Oh yeah, totally. There would have been like, Hey, behind uh, the scenes photos of like, Hey, here's uh, Piper Laurie, you know, with makeup and her makeup. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. I, uh, but back then it worked. mm -hmm. Back then, Starlog did what you told them to do. Right. I love Starlog magazine. If you paid them enough, they told they told the world your movie was good, and they kept your secret. Mm-hmm. Damn it. Yeah. And uh, and when they for Comic Scene magazine, you could get them to like tell everybody that uh, hey, this movie's going to happen. It's totally one hundred percent going to happen, and it never happens. And it never happens. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. I have been. What is it? What have been, what have been like, like all, remember all those that Doctor Strange movie back in the nineteen eighties, or you know, yeah, it yeah. Nobody happened. remembers this. <laughs> nobody had. Nobody remembers because yeah. they never happened. Because never happened. And how many years has it been? Thirty-four years that I've been waiting for the World Crime League to be a movie. 
Don't get me started on that one. I don't even want to talk about that. <sighs> We're not going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about Bonsai. I'm going to leave him out of it. <laughs> I would totally write that film if I could for free. <laughs> I, I think we've all written that film at least three times in our head. <laughs> oh, my God. You that and before true. before we got the return, I would do that with Twin Peaks season three. I would have written that completely for free if they would just, let, if they would let. Yeah, me. seriously. Yeah, I would I would have paid them. Yes, to do it. exactly. Just, just to get it done. <laughs> like if they would have just let me get in there and do some stuff. Yeah. <laughs> like, and I'm sorry. In my world, in Twin Peaks, Cooper and Audrey got married. You think? Uh, that's what I would have wanted to happen. You know, he needed. To, Maybe not he right away. Maybe not was... right away, but after some time passed. No, like when she when she was like thirty. Oh, I see what you're saying. Down the road. Yeah, when she was like thirty. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, like yeah, after... obviously, obviously older. If you know, with like ten years down the road, uh, that right. that age difference would have been no, not an issue. Yeah, nobody would have paid any attention to right. it. Right. And uh, we would have. Um, we we definitely would have seen. I and I and I would have kept Bobby and Shelly together just right. like they did in the return. It was no red. And uh well, I mean even even if they got divorced along the way, I would have kept them together after this whole thing. Right. Um but I would have I also would have let Norma and Ed be together. Oh yeah, you know, especially yeah, yeah. yeah. Much sooner. Much much sooner. Much, than much sooner. Yeah. 25 freaking years. To have to wait, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a long time to have to wait for, you know, just, you know, coming back from a camping trip and getting kicked off, right. you know, but, uh, I would have wanted something really good for Nadine though. Like, like maybe, you know, she would have fallen in love with Mike for real or something and he would have been a nice guy. I don't know. I don't want Nadine to get screwed in this equation, but, uh, well, she, have, she's one of the few characters that actually got a happy ending. In the return, he did. Yeah, yeah. That whole that whole crew got kind of a happy ending. Yeah, you know, and the fact that you know, the fact that Nadine made it out of her psychosis, you know, somewhat intact, that yeah. helps. Yeah, she kind of like went right through her sanity, insanity, and came out the other side. Oh yeah, totally. Oh, oh, hey, speaking of the return, because, yes, yes, I uh, wanted to um, tell you about what I found at the Akron Comic Con. Uh oh. Did you get some cards? I did. <gasps> What'd you get? I sure did. What'd you get? I was able to complete my base set. Yay! What I did was there was a guy, a, a card dealer there. Yeah. Who had a box. And... He had some singles? Well, what he had done, somebody, what, what somebody had done was they had taken the autograph cards out. Okay. They left all the other chase cards in, but they had like steamed them open. Yeah. And taken, he kept telling me the autograph cards are gone, but they're sealed. I'm like, that is not physically possible. So tell <laughs> me another one. What the hell does that even mean? Right. So, um, what happened is that they, they, they got steamed open, yeah. the autograph cards were taken out and everything got put back in. Okay. Um, which is kind of a dick move. That you it's just... kind of a dick move, but I got the, I got a full box of regular series cards and other chase cards cool. for $25. That's not bad. That's not bad. That's not bad. That's worth it. And I got a Bradley Mitchum character card. Oh, cool. So I was very excited about that. That's very cool. Yeah, I got that and some other stuff. And I got one of those like rough cardboard ones. So that was Jim Belushi's character, right? Not the, That's Jim uh, Not Robert Nepper. Rob- no, yeah, it's Jim Belushi's character. Okay. Um, and uh, which reminds me, I tried to post something from my phone onto our Ghostwood page and it never posted. I need to... Try that again. I need to see what the deal is with that. Um, you should be I able went to, to. Yeah, I went to it. Yeah, it it just for some reason I was having trouble posting over the weekend. This past weekend I went to uh, Wisconsin mm-hmm. and uh, to visit family. And in Wisconsin is a bar called Sobelman's that's famous for its ridiculously over the top Bloody Marys. Okay. Like they have one Bloody Mary that you can get that has an entire fried chicken on it, like as the garnish. <laughs> like it's just it's like man versus food, ridiculous food porn kind of stuff. That's funny. So, um, yeah, I tried to post a picture of that on our uh, on our pay- Facebook page, but I didn't. It, for some reason, it didn't post. But yes, I was able to complete my set, so I have a full yay. Good I have for a full you. Base now set I feel now it. I feel better. Not 
you know, you giving me enough the the cards to finish off my base set. It just was stupid that we would both have, you know, out of two whole boxes, right. we would both only have incomplete sets. That was dumb. Yeah. So well, that was. I'm I'm glad you you know your your karma was rewarded. I thought so. And something I'm finding out that when you go to comic conventions, yeah. The pop dealers are carrying the pop pez, so I kind of made out on those. Oh, you did? Did you find the Doctor okay. Who? No, those are not out yet. Oh, they're not. Okay. We'll yeah, I think they're. I think they're December. Okay. I think those are December, right. or they're just coming out. But I did. I'm going to get somber here, and I know it's not Twin Peaks related. Right. I did get the Stan Lee one. In honor of Stan, yeah, we should. So. We should mention, yeah, for those who don't know, and you must be living under a rock if you don't know. Or you're just not a geek in that sort of a fashion. Yeah, exactly. Um, Stan Lee passed this week. Yes, which was he did. A, 95. A, a huge deal. Um, obviously, Stan Lee, a legend. Uh, because with Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, John Buscema, um, just so many other, Don Heck, so many other artists that co-created the Marvel Universe. Pretty much, yep. And, uh, yeah. Whatever you know about the Marvel Universe is, is pretty much... Exactly, and obviously... It's pretty much Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, and Stan Lee. Yeah. So, it... Uh, you know, because obviously... It was a big Doc- deal, but yeah. Doctor I, Strange, the Fantastic Four, Incredible Hulk... Spider-Man. Spider-Man, the little character by yep. the name of Spider-Man, the Avengers. Yep. And so, um, pretty... I mean, Jack Kirby is, you know, one of the greatest artists of all time. Right. Um and he 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 brought those characters to life, but yeah, him him and Stan working together created everything that we pretty much know yeah. from Marvel today. Um, I had the I personally no, I bought it. Go ahead. I bought it before Stan Lee had passed. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I got a much better price on it than I would if I bought it now. Right. But yeah, uh, I'm sure I'm sure there are a lot of people just using his death to jack up those prices on eBay. And that's what's that's what's worrying me because you know Stan Lee does have his own pop figure as well. Right. So I have a feeling that kind of stuff is going to go through the roof, which is kind of ridiculous. It is. But, but that's, yeah, that's um, people. So, yep, yeah, humans. Humans but, are the worst people I know. They are. But uh, I got to actually meet Stan a couple times at conventions. One was at the 1988 Superman International Superman Expo in Cleveland. That seems like not the place for Stan Lee, but okay. Well, well that's what I mean. That's what made it so great was that – he was there for the competition's flagship character. So, well, and that's the thing about Stan Lee. I mean, say what you want to about him for being a credit hog, which yeah. he was. Right. Um, he he's not so much a credit hog, but when people say, yeah. "Hey, did you create Spider? You created Spider Man, did you?" He didn't correct them. That's that's his biggest problem. Is he yeah. didn't correct it. Right. right. But talk about the master of self promotion. Yeah, he was he was basically a, a great salesman. Mm-hmm. And he was a uh, he was essentially if you if you read the New Gods, uh, Jack Kirby's The New Gods, he was funky Flashman through and through. Oh, completely, completely. So he he knew how. And the thing is, people who have no clue about comic books know who Stan Lee is. Right. And uh, but, but I never but, met. But, but that worked because when Stan went out to Hollywood mm-hmm. for Marvel. And yep. um, ended up like producing shows, and he like when I was a kid, they had like shows like the um, Spider Man and His Amazing Friends, which I love. Oh yeah, and he was narrating that, and you know other shows like the Incredible Hulk cartoon, and he was the face of Marvel. He he was totally the face and, of Marvel. And, and I go ahead. I my you know my first exposure to Spider Man. As a child, was the electric company right? That was mine as so, well. And then was they, it? Then they got Spidey Super Stories as a result yep. of seeing Spider Man on the electric company. Yep, we're going to bring in the power. Yeah, and then also the the um, the '60s Spider Man cartoon that was in syndication. Does whatever a spider can. That's exactly. where that song comes. Because I would come yeah. home from school, elementary school, and then that cartoon would be on, and my life was good. Good times. Good times. Good times. I watched that and with Battle of the Planets and Star Blazers, and it was great. That, that sounds like a fun afternoon, my It friend. was an awesome – and they had like Fleischer Popeye cartoons. The best thing ever. Right. And so, yeah, this was WUAB 43 out of Cleveland airing this. 
Yeah. And WUAB was, plays favorites, so what do. I is yeah. so I hear. So that was that was the best station for a kid back in the day. You come home from school and you watch all these great cartoon shows. Speaking of WUAB, guess what I found? I didn't buy one. Yeah. But guess what somebody had at the at that Akron show? What? Superhost t shirts. Oh, that's cool. I would I would have like I want, I want a big Chuck and Little John shirt. That, I think they I think they probably had something like that. I yeah. I was I was more big Chuck and Little John than Superhost. I was more Superhost because he was the um he was the movies, like the Saturday afternoon movies. Right. So yeah, he's the. For those of you who don't know, he was like the superhero equivalent of Goulardi. Yes. You know, he was a man wearing a Superman type tights outfit. Yeah. He really shouldn't have been, but he was yeah. adorable. Yeah, basically, he was this middle aged guy in like blue long johns, made up to look kind of resemble Superman. Yes, it was. And it was put together with, for about four dollars. And for some reason, he had like a little clown dot nose on it. He had a red nose. nose, like he was yeah. drunk Superman or something. Yeah, like, it I was know, very I weird. Don't know what it was but but uh, yeah, no, I never met Stan Lee. Um, honestly, because um, I didn't want to stand in line for him, right? Because it was my it would have been my whole day, right? And um, that jerk who was his management wouldn't let anybody else get near him outside of it. Okay. So even though he and I were in the same group that went to the koala sanctuary, right? They surrounded him like vultures and wouldn't let anybody come up to him and say hi or talk to him. Even people, even people from the convention in our own group weren't allowed to talk to him. So really? I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I'm, gl- I'm hoping that crew gets uh, prosecuted. But, um, but the. Uh, no, but I had I got to meet Stan a couple times and had a really positive experiences both times. Everybody I know who who has has said the he that was, exact. Thing. He was so friendly and you know took time talking to me and like I've got um you know he signed some things for free. And, That's very sweet. And you know like he signed a photo and then he's like I've got um uh, a Silver Surfer Marvel Masterworks signed by him and John Buscema. You see my and, wow, yeah. So wow, that's amazing. Yeah, so I'm very. That's one of my treasured things. I'm never gonna part with. Wrap that that drizz in plastic, my friend. Cause... Well, that's just like yeah, that's just it's awesome. Yeah. And so, um, I'm just, but I was just so appreciative. I'm just like you know, great. Um, it was just it was it was growing up hearing him and the fact that like okay, yeah. um, finally getting to meet him and him being very polite and friendly and not like mm-hmm. taking it for granted for his fans. Well, and I think, I think Stan Lee was energized by fans because yeah. I saw him behind the scenes a right. lot at conventions where he's tired and he looks like he's half asleep. But the right. second you get him in with the fans, he's on. Right. right. And he's just, I think, I think the fans energized him. And I think that um, he wanted every fan to have a good experience because that, like I said, yeah. he is a, promotion machine right. he wants you to have a good experience with marvel comics end of story there, one of the one there, of the fun things that happened when we were at the koala sanctuary was when we went to the koala sanctuary the rest of us took a river boat like tour through brisbane mm-hmm. um it was a river like a river cruise sort of a thing and it took about it took an hour or so and something like that and when we got out when we got off we had to climb like these stairs up a hill to get there and there's no way stan lee could have done that so he he was driven Right. Um, to do that. And, but when we got there, we were, we were all there. We had our pictures taken with koalas and I was, you know, waiting for some friends and we were going to move on. And Stan Lee comes rolling up <laughs> and just like nothing, you know, just like, like, Oh, Hey, I'm here at the zoo. Right. Yeah. So he's, he comes rolling up and there was a guy next to me and he just looks at me and he, he's like, it's like, that's Stan Lee. And he looks at, <laughs> and I'm just, I'm just kind of laughing. He's like, he looks at me. He's like, is that Stan Lee? <laughs> I said, yeah, it is. And he's like, why? <laughs> and I was like, it was like, it was a long story. He was here for the convention. Now we're all here for the, and he's like, that's Stan Lee. It was just this, these people who happened to be at the zoo this day, got to see Stan Lee hold a koala. It was freaking adorable. Well, how, how often do you get to see that to be fair? Yeah, I mean, yeah, so yeah. Like how often are you at, how often do you get to hold a koala? First of all, and then how right. often do you get to hold a koala and then watch Stan Lee hold a koala? Exactly. So that's like, for me, it's only happened to one Exactly, but you got to experience it, so that's something I it was just, obviously it was will just never so get to fun experience. to see that to see that one guy look at me. He's like, "Is that Stan Lee?" Yeah, yeah. why? It, it was just a very surreal moment. I had to be. Why is he here? Yeah. 
<laughs> it was but, bizarre. So but I'm going to tell you something about Stan Lee. Yeah. That was actual hair. Really? Good. Because I sat well, behind well, him. Well, you know, like during the 70s and, and early 80s, he definitely wore a toupee. Mm-hmm. But he got rid of it as he got older. It's definitely like long in the back and combed up. Yeah. But it, yeah. I, there are follicles. Yeah. Those were follicles. Right. So. Yeah, because I was sitting behind him at the Raptor show at the at the sanctuary, and uh, yeah, that's hair. Yeah. So. so there are legitimate criticisms about Stan Lee you can you can make, obviously, but, but there's uh, also but there was, there's also but there was some good there was plenty of good things you can yeah. say about Stan Lee and the fact that he created all these characters that are going to last. Co-created. You know, co-created. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yes. With Jack Kirby. <laughs> Joe, sorry, I get in the habit of it. Um, yes. It's easy because co- he. That's like I said. He never corrected anybody. Right. So yeah. yes, he co-created all these characters with with artists like Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, again Don Heck, and uh, you know that they're going to last. And, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, absolutely. You know they're going to they're going to be around far longer than we will. Oh, for sure. And um, that right there is is something you can credit him for. Yes, absolutely. As well absolutely. as crediting the artist, obviously. And you can you uh, you can credit him for being for for knowing how to promote your right. product, right? Because, and, like but, I said, people who have no idea about comics yeah. know who Stanley is, yeah, and, I think and with, know that Stanley and Marvel Comics are like bacon and eggs, right? And he helped create the, turn Marvel from just a comics company into an empire. Mm-hmm. Because of his actions, because of reaching out to things like TV, movies, animation, Self promotion machine, exactly. Yeah. So, and then that you know, obviously, um, helped to develop. And and I know this isn't talking about Twin. I mean, this has nothing to do with Twin Peaks, but um, it's just something that I think we need to acknowledge because he just was such a, a creative force, and mm-hmm. and uh, in pop uh, culture. And, a, you know? and definitely a pop culture icon, exactly. Absolutely, right. absolutely. Okay, um, so n- we didn't talk about our ratings. To get back to the Twin Peaks, so what's your ratings for this one? My uh, my rating for this one is uh, eight out of ten hat boxes. <laughs> hat boxes from Seattle. Right, nice. Empty, and, uh, probably empty hat boxes. Yeah, like I said, when has Josie ever worn a hat? I never see her wear a hat. Exactly. Um, the reason I give it an eight is because mm-hmm. um, I feel like the M.T. Wentz plotline yeah. is a little more comic relief than it is red herring. Right. And, you know, I, I think that having it having it be a red herring so you think that all these people who are in town, um, you know, like – like uh, what's his name? I can't. I, we just said it. I can't think of it. Um, and then Tajimura. Piper Lori. Taj- yeah, Mr. Tajimura. Yeah, Mr. Tajimura, and um, and then Piper Lori coming in all, all mysterious. That, that that we need that w- red herring where there's something going on that's throwing everybody off the scent of those people. Right. But I think it was a little too much of a comic relief thing. Like if it would but, been treated more seriously. It would have been more effective. Right. I just, but I think it's like, well, let's get flowers and let's get, you know, I mean, it just sort of yeah. became, you know, you know, frog, go eat in the kitchen. It just became kind of a comic relief okay. bit. That's fair. And that just, that kind of left me cold. And I, I you know, the thing is I, I'm looking at this too from a retroactive standpoint, you know, hindsight being 2020. Yeah. I know that this empty wins pot line is just going to piss me off and make me sad for Norma. <laughs> Got it. So um because so, uh, so it's kind of clouding your opinion a little bit i think it is clouding my opinion a little bit because kids i have eaten at the double r diner and yes, it is have. four and a half out of five stars thank you very much you like the food i liked the food i liked the atmosphere i liked the pie is it the greatest pie i've ever eaten no but i'm still waiting for the greatest pie i've ever eaten it's a perfectly decent pie though but it's perfectly decent pie and it's a lovely location. It's a nice retro diner. Like I said, it's like it's like four, four and a half stars out of five to there, me. There you go. It's diner food, kids. That's, You're not going to go in there and get amuse bouches or sushi that you can only get for you know eighty dollars a piece of sashimi. It's diner food. You're going to get burgers. You're going to get meatloaf. You're going right. to get pancakes. You're going to get if, you if know. You, now, if you like diner food, I like I love diner food. I'll bet you do. So, so yeah, because I mean, obviously, I grew up in a family restaurant. So yeah, I'm. Yeah, more than happy to eat diner food, and the um, 
So I would definitely appreciate something like that. I would love, oh, yeah. I'm hoping one day I will get to go there and experience I that. wish your parents still had their restaurant because <laughs> I want to go in there with you and just for out of note for no reason, yeah. just say, right. Are you talking about that literal girl that got murdered? <laughs> Well, wanna... well, it wasn't like a diner diner. It was more like a, I, it was a family right, that... It was like, you know, like a, um, uh, what's a good comparison? Like a, like a, chef like, a, like, a, like, a place. like a Perkins. Right. But that, but yeah. that place kind of was like that with it. With, there's lots of, ta- it's big. Yeah. It's lots of right. tables. It was just right. Exactly. Rest, but, but, but you had booths yeah. and you had waitresses yes. and all that. So yeah. And yes, you had, you know, exactly. like a, like a cook in the back and yeah. So that kind mm-hmm. of thing. Right. So that's what I, that's what I grew up with. Yeah. Right. And I love, I love diner food too. Cause I just, you know, <laughs> I have to go for that retro fifties charm. Yep. I do too. So. I, I, I love fifties diners. So oh, yeah. like yeah. When, when we had Johnny Rockets, I love that. Oh my gosh, Charles. That was the, that was the hip place back in the day. So you should have lived here in Columbus when we had Jerry's drive-in. Oh, I would love to see. I love drive-ins too. Jerry's drive-in was, it had a, it, it was a restaurant with, you know, booths and tables and then it had a drive-in, and then it had uh, cruise-ins every like every first Saturday or something like that. Right. It is a TJ's now, <laughs> <laughs> but it was so great when it was Jerry's drive-in. It was it was an incredible place, and I, I miss it. If I, I mean, it. I you know, my uh, I just I would love it if somebody could just m- create a, a franchise of double R diners. Well, they did. <laughs> well. <laughs> Yeah, for Norma did, Norma Norma did, but yeah. Yeah, Norma did. Yeah. Norma did. For for real. So what's your rating, Charles? Uh I give this one I'm a little more generous. I like this one. Okay. I think there's some um great character moments and uh it's if nothing else it's worth it to see Hank getting the crap kicked out of him and Emery Battis getting offed by Jean Renault. Oh, you know, I'm going to raise mine to eight and a half because of, because of, uh, <laughs> did I persuade Emory you? Battis, yeah. Every <laughs> bad is getting killed. That's going to raise me up to eight and a half. Yeah. See, that, and that's why eight and a half stuff, good, dead mongooses. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. I think, I think for me, I think also comparing it to the previous episode yeah. where we opened a bunch of cans of worms. Right. But in this episode, I feel like we have a lot of slow moving worms. I think this is good, but just in a completely different way from the previous episode. Right. I just think it. I think it. It kind of. It kind of slows it, the momentum it, it, down it, a little it, bit. It, it is. Yeah. It does. It, it doesn't really advance the Laura Palmer storyline much. Although we get some stuff yeah. with Harold and Leland, right. and Leland. And I like the Leland stuff too. Right. Because we start to see Leland starting to crack here. Leland. I mean, he was cracked before, yeah. but he's really he's cracking. He's really now. losing his mind. Yeah. The fact that he was just so checked out at the beginning of yeah. this. Absolutely. Yeah. Leland's, Leland's got, he's full of secrets and he's got problems. Yeah. And knowing what we know about Leland, this is obviously the beginning of the, the big final downward slide. Yes. Yes. This is Leland. Like he's on, he, he's Leland's on the, roller, he's on the roller, roller coaster. He's just went over the hump. And now uh-huh. he's starting to race right down the other side. Yeah. And this is, yeah, we're, we're not going to see Leland for much longer. So we got to take our, uh, yep. enjoy that raise wise while you can folks. <laughs> we got to take our raise wise while we can still get him. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, next time on Ghostwood, we're going to talk about the orchids curse. So get your garden rakes handy for this one. Charles. Just fly. <laughs> Why do you have to pick at the garden rakes, Gab? Well, for this episode, it's 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 warranted, I think. Well, this is well, this is when we when it happens. Exactly. But yeah, you all are going to be just as mad at Donna as I am. <laughs> this, this is a this is a bitch move on her part, if you ask me. Yeah. Well, let's let's not. You know, Harold isn't completely blameless here. No, like I said, you're right. Harold has his creepy moments. Yes, he but, does. Yes, he you know does. they. You know they play it. They play the same kind of trick on him that they played on Doctor Jacoby. Right. Because remember, so Harold, cool that ended. Harold was intentionally withholding evidence from the Twin Peaks Sheriff's Department because his, Laura's diary was his. See, and that's the kind of crap that I can't that 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 does tick me off about Harold. I have a problem with that sort of right. Um, like because and, it, and you hear this all the time in in actual in actual crimes. It's like, why didn't you tell the police? They never asked. Yeah. 
like, okay, well, maybe you should volunteer this information. Maybe you should volunteer the information, please. Yeah. What the heck is wrong with you? So that's, that's kind of my major beef with Harold is that. You and know, that's a, that's a reasonable beef right there. Yeah. It's like he was intentionally withholding evidence. Uh, mm-hmm. He did not volunteer it. He didn't reach out to authorities. Nope. So nope. he could have caught, picked up the freaking phone if he didn't want to go out of his house. Well, and I can understand where Harold is coming from in a crazy part of it because he did mm-hmm. prom- He did make a promise to Laura right. to keep it safe. He doesn't, and, he doesn't openly share the diary with Donna. And it's not like the diary is going to bring her back. Right. But at the same time, and, and I guess I, I think I'm a little more forgiving with it too because I know that it's not going to do a damn bit of good. Right. Well, that's, no. that's Harold's argument here in this episode that we just watched yeah. is that he goes, well, I already looked through it and the there's, police, nothing here. there's nothing here for the police to worry themselves about. Yeah. I'm going to keep this. <laughs> and that, and the thing is, he's, you know, like I said last time where you have that, you have that uh, moment where Donna is, and James are talking to Maddie saying, we want to find out who we're worried. We loved Lauren. We're worried that whoever's responsible for this is never going to get caught. And it's like, yeah, that's kind of what happens. <laughs> they never, they never, they le- they legit never get caught. Right. And so, I think I might be a little bit more forgiving of Harold because I know that. But you're right. That's a, that's that's not cool. It's not cool to so, to do that. Yeah. So so, I mean, I get where you're coming from with Donna because I think Donna handles it badly, but I think also Harold handles it badly. I think Harold. There's, well, there's, Harold, there's plenty of mistakes to go around here. Harold's also crazy. Harold's Donna's also, kind of a bitch. Right. And, you know, especially, you know, like I said, her whole, like, drama with, you know, James and Maddie, you know, oh, God forbid they talk to each other about something tragic that happened to both of them. Yeah. You know? Well, Donna, as we find, as we've noticed and continue to notice as the show progresses, is a serious drama queen. Serious, serious, serious drama queen. Yeah. And I don't, uh, I don't suffer drama queens very well. (laughs) No, no, I know you don't. I'll I'll admit it. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, that may be part of the bias, I guess, toward Donna. That could very well be part of my bias, yes. All right. So, yeah, so we're going to talk about the Orchid's Curse next time. In the meantime, if you want to get a hold of us here and let us know what you thought about uh, Laura's Secret Diary that we just watched or the Orchid's Curse or any other Twin Beaks episodes, for that matter, you can drop us a line. anything, frankly. Exactly. You can drop us a line on the email, the email. The email. The email. Ghostwoodpodcast at gmail.com. That's ghostwoodpodcast at gmail.com. Or you can reach us on the Twitter at ghost at ghostwoodcast. We definitely appreciate that if you followed us there. Or you can like us and follow us on Facebook at Ghostwood, the Twin Peaks podcast. So that would be great. Or if you want to go to Apple iTunes... You could leave us a review and rate us, and we would definitely appreciate that because, hey, that helps people find us. That helps people find us, yep. And uh, while you're at it, also uh, go to the Southgate Media Patreon page and uh, throw our editor, Rob Southgate, a couple bucks and help keep the lights on for Ghostwood because, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, all this Twin Peaks stuff isn't cheap, yo. So These Twin Peaks references ain't going to pay for themselves. Exactly. Much as we wish they would, but that'd be nice. It yeah, would be nice. So, uh, but hey, you know, when you listen, you can, you know, you can give us a dollar a month, and then you don't have to have somebody try and guilt you into buying right. Bombas socks. <laughs> exactly. Because for right now, we're well, ad free because so we rely on you, the listener. So maybe you just you know skip that one overpriced coffee and uh, help keep the lights on. That would, I'm sure Rob Southgate would appreciate that. You can go to SouthgateMediaGroup.com for more information. All right. So, uh, Zan, where can they find you on the interwebs? I'm on the Twitters and on the Instagrams yeah. as Udamax19. is the best way to find me. Right. What about you, Charles? Because well, you do like, you do, you know, one or two other podcasts, right? I do like 50. I don't know. No. I know. You do them all. <laughs> <laughs> I do four, including this one. Uh, so, obviously, you can reach me at Charles Skaggs on the Twitter or at Charles Skaggs on the Insta. Instagram. And then Facebook, of course, at Charles Skaggs in Hilliard, Ohio. And uh, my blog of geeky things. Damn good coffee. 
and hot. Damn good coffee and hot, where I talk about all the stuff we talk about here on Ghostwood, Twin Peaks, David Lynch, or comic books, sci-fi news. All things pop culture. All things of my other podcasts they do for Southgate Media Group, including the award-winning Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast. They do with Jesse Jackson and Karen Lindsay. And also... Uh, Titan Talk, the Titans podcast that do with Jesse, where we talk about the DC Universe series Titans and probably going to be talking about Young Justice and Doom Patrol. And that's going to be a lot of fun when we get to Doom Patrol because I can't I'm a big Doom Patrol fan, which is right up Twin Peaks fans alley, I might add. And then um, the Phantom Zone podcast that I do with Karen Lindsay, where we talk about comic book shows on television. And right now we're reviewing shows like Legends of Tomorrow, Daredevil on Netflix. We're There's so many. The Flash, Black Lightning. Uh, we just reviewed um, Andrew Lincoln's final episode of The Walking Dead before he goes off to do TV movies, reprising the same character. And then, oh, yeah. you know, Fox is the Gifted, Supergirl, you name it. We're, we're covering it. And... Um, so if you enjoy that kind of the kind of programs, uh, go check out that podcast because we will talk about all those episodes and more. So please check those out, and I would definitely appreciate that. Otherwise, uh, come on back. Two weeks, we're going to have a little Thanksgiving break as we um, watch a lot of MST3K. I was going to say, Zan's other obsession on television. Eat a lot of pie or what have you. Ooh, I got to, I got to look to see if I can find mincemeat because nobody yep. ever makes a mincemeat pie but me. Yep. And mashed potatoes without gravy, apparently. Without gravy? Yeah, no gravy. <laughs> no gravy for Zan. Nope. None. Yep. So feel bad for her. <laughs> the, uh, no, it's and, probably better that I don't eat any gravy, but... Uh, yeah, but when it's Thanksgiving, you want, you want the gravy. It's not what I'm used to. We'll just say that. It's just not what I'm used to. Yeah, yeah. so... Uh, so come on back for the Orchid's Curse, everybody. It's going to be a lot of fun and um, probably going to be talking some Harold Smith, I would think, quite a bit in this okay. episode. Yeah, Because it's our last chance to talk about Harold. Yep. So this is going to be a good one. So Zan's going to have to break out the tissue box because we may be saying farewell to Harold Smith. Oh, and you even have an owl cave symbol on it. Yes, I do. Nice. <laughs> I have a Twin Peaks tissue box, kids. Yeah, that is awesome. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm so I, jelly. I can't handle Kleenex that when you try to take one, you right. take the whole box with you. Right. So I have those covers on all the tissue boxes in my house. Cool. Also, those covers don't get cat teeth marks on them. Oh, you're, you have a problem with cats eating your tissue boxes? Oh my good lord! My mom, when one time when she was cat sitting, we have a coffee table that has little pockets in it, right? And I keep a thing of tissues in there, but I keep it so the tissues and the top of the pocket are flush, and so you can't you have to pull it out to see the tissues. Well, my mom turned it so she could just pull the tissues out, and when she came back and she saw that I had moved it, she's like, "Oh, you didn't like what I did?" I'm like, "Not that I don't like it. It's that it's not going to last. That I'm going to see like a hundred tissues on the floor." If I leave it that way. Funny. So that's yeah. funny. So I'm not going to have a Christmas tree either for that exact same thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had, a, we always had a problem with our cat Keiko climbing the Christmas tree and, mm-hmm. and not yep. wanting to come out. Yeah. See, well, we have, we have a uh, Jess Bell who likes to chew on wires. She has no concept of the fact that that will kill her. Yeah. She just knows that it gets our attention. So, yeah. so she does it. So, Yeah. So, all right, so bad. so fingers crossed for no electrocuted kitties this holiday season. And uh, otherwise, we will see you again for the Orchid's Curse because you're coming back, right? Right. Next time, right here. I'll be back. Yep. So we'll see you right here next time on Ghost with the Twin Peaks Podcast. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.